<laughs> Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for joining us for the webinar, Introduction to Trail Management. This is part three of a three-part series. And oh, sorry, I had to mute you, Kim, for a second there. It's part three of a three-part series on the Introduction to Trail Planning design and development, and management. And my name is Candace Gallagher, and I am the Director of Operations and Webinar Coordinator for American Trails. This is our 130th webinar in the American Trails Advancing Trails webinar series. And this free webinar is being recorded. It offers learning credits and includes real-time closed captioning in English. And if you don't already see a link in the chat box, um, you will see one momentarily. And attendees will receive a closed caption transcript and a link to the recording in my follow-up email that I will send within one to three business days. Uh, we are saving time for attendee questions at the end of the webinar. Um, and the presenter would also like to ask some questions in regards to trail management um, in the middle of the webinar. So if you have those questions as he's talking about management, definitely um, um, share them via the questions box at any time during the presentation. And I want to also thank um, the partners of our webinar today that include the Bureau of Land Management, the Federal Highway Administration, the National Park Service, as well as the U.S. Forest Service. And I will introduce uh, to, uh, you today to the presenter. We have Kim Frederick. Um, many of you are already very well aware of him. Um, owner of Chinook Associates, he is based out of Colorado. So I will now hand controls off to Kim to get started. Thanks so much, Candace. Let me get my PowerPoint up. I'm assuming everyone can see that. Welcome, everyone. I'm happy that you're all here today and looking forward to this third and final uh, PowerPoint presentation. And uh, on uh, today's topic, it's going to be trail management. <clears throat> And uh, uh, I want to uh, initiate the conversation by uh, welcoming you all. I think we've got, uh, I think Candace had shared with me, there were over just south of 700 individuals that signed up for this webinar, registered for it, and, and uh, that's very exciting. And uh, <clears throat> I want to say thanks to the, our friends at American Trails and all the support that team provides the individuals, myself specifically, in uh, uh, delivering these. So that's great stuff all the way around. So. Uh, with little or no ado, I'll just simply jump right into it. Uh, today's uh, workshop is going to be on trail management and uh, some key topics that we'll be covering today. One of them uh, topic will be visitor management and the second topic will be maintenance management. So I've actually broken this trail management discussion up into two areas, one being visitor management, which will be first and we're going to talk about managing people, if you will, and their trail uh, experiences. And then we're going to be spending some time talking about the physical elements and some uh, content around trail maintenance management. So it's kind of where that's the key points we'll be discovering or discussing. Visitor management will be first. And I thought it'd be good for uh, me to, to begin the conversation by providing a little bit of a definition for even both of these doc, uh, topics. So uh, take a few moments, as, if you will, please, and take a look at that uh, definition there. So what visitor management actually, in terms of this definition that I've created, my, is uh, it's, uh, about, it's about developing tools uh, to uh, support uh, visitor, positive visitor experiences and uh, uh, identifying and maintaining desired resource conditions. So that would be visitor management. And then the next piece is maintenance management. And take just a moment and read that if you can. So again, maintenance management then is uh, all about uh, <clears throat> putting together a program where you have uh, scheduled activities to keep your uh, uh, assets uh, in acceptable conditions and uh, maximize and extend perhaps their uh, uh, service life cycle. So that's uh, what maintenance management and the context of this conversation would be. So 
those are a couple of terms and we may revisit those as we go through the workshop, but I wanted to kind of get this party started, if you will, by initiating a little bit of a participant poll and, and uh, Candace should be tossing up this poll in just a moment. Great, so the poll is open uh, and uh, we'd like for y'all to take just a second and answer these two questions very quickly. Uh, yes or no, my organization does an effective job of visitor management, yes or no as well as my organization does an effective job of maintenance management, yes or no. Uh, <clears throat> I'd like, uh, 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 while you're filling out that poll and we have a couple of uh, seconds here, uh, I wanted to just uh, tell you a little bit about myself. So, uh, Candace uh, introduced me briefly and I do live in the foothills west of Denver. Uh, recently retired from uh, 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 working with a local county open space program uh, uh, just west of Denver and where I, worked for, uh, started to work there in 1978, and I left in 2018. So I worked for 40 years managing the trail system at that location. It was at about 250 miles of natural surface trail, spread out over 35 or 40 parcels, parks, if you will, and roughly 60,000 uh, acres of uh, open space was being managed, had it been acquired. So that's a little bit about that. Uh, managed a youth core and volunteer programming, uh, staff professional staff and uh, 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 a whole group of uh, active users primarily uh, pedestrians uh, cyclists mountain bikers and equestrians so that's good i have a little consulting service that i do periodically uh, where i provide uh, trail trainings as well as management planning content and uh, uh, i also uh, uh, do some instruction at a local community college where I'm teaching some trail design and construction courses here in the foothills. So that's about it. So Candace, I'm just kind of curious, how did our how did our poll go? Have you been able to uh, uh, close that? Yes, the first poll, um, I had shared the results. Um, my organization does an effective job of visitor management. It was 57% yes and 43% uh, no for those that answered. And now we have the second poll um, going right now. My organization does an effective job of maintenance management. And great. I'm gonna close that here in a few seconds. That sounds great. So I've had opportunity to do this work, uh, training and what have you in a variety of locations. I did some of it, uh, I've done work all across the country, been working with American Trails in a variety of different capacities. and. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, let me see if I can open this. Anyhow, that's great. Can you go ahead then and uh, share with us the results of that final poll? Yes. Do you see that on your end or no? I can't see it as a matter of nope. fact. No worries. Okay. Well, then again, the question, my organization does an effective job of maintenance management. We have uh, 49 percent yes and 51 percent no of those that answered that's great so in summary as i recall what you were suggesting or if i jotted down my notes correctly uh candace you were indicating that 57 percent of the uh, respondents to the poll felt like they did a fairly good job of visitor management so that's just a little over half of the uh, <clears throat> Uh, just about 300 people that we've got in the class 250 and then just about uh, just right at half, about 50% of them felt like they did a pretty good job of uh, doing maintenance management as well. So that's that's an interesting response. I'm I'm frankly uh, uh, kind of surprised that it's as high as it is, and I feel good about that. That's great. I feel like I'm I'm uh, working with a great group of folks here, well, and hopefully you'll be able to glean something from today's conversation, folks, that will. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, support your efforts in both uh, visitor as well as in trail management. So thanks for posting those questions, Candace, and I'll jump right into the presentation. We're going to start with visitor management. And the uh, <clears throat> the thing I want to talk about first and create a little bit of context. So why build trails, right? So uh, a couple of different elements associated with that. So certainly trails, uh, there's a, a wealth of uh, information out there that supports how uh, uh, people that uh, spend time walking and recreating on, uh, uh, on parks and, and trails uh, have an increase in health. So there's huge health benefits associated with recreational trails and uh, exercising. Uh, <clears throat> another reason to build trails is uh, uh, 
They can certainly uh, provide for a, a strong economic engine for communities. Uh, you know, there are a lot of communities in the, uh, around the country that have their uh, 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 fundamental to their oh, tax base, if you will, or outdoor recreation activities and trails are a big part of that. So certainly and undeniably trails can uh, contribute to uh, uh, the economic engine of a region or an area. And then, you know, also certainly trails uh, contribute to uh, conservation measures. They protect the land that we've got you know, by providing uh, sustainable and responsible access. And, and uh, <clears throat> so one of the things that I think is important and kind of, a, a, again, a little context for today as we're thinking about visitor management, that trails are the conduit for folks to get out and uh, have some kind of experience on the landscape. So uh, <clears throat> keep that these thoughts in mind as we're talking about different elements associated with visitor management. So where are trails developed? So trails are certainly created in an urban environment as illustrated in this image here. You can see this is a trail system that has a, a concrete uh, surface. It's 12 to 14 feet in width, a variety of users. It's got, it's certainly in an urban or a, a city area, uh, cyclists uh, likely being used for transportation purposes for people to uh, get to work or go shopping, as well as for people to socialize and exercise. So certainly trails are developed in an urban environment and in a rural environment as well. So this in, in image here kind of illustrates what a typical setting might be in a rural environment where you have, you know, some perhaps some vegetation that's been removed, uh, uh, a natural surface or a, a local material or a native surface type of uh, trail tread of could be 24, 18, 24, 36 inches in width in a rural environment. And then the third area that I thought I might just kind of introduce or uh, just comment on briefly is trails are developed certainly in, in a wilderness area and uh, in areas uh, uh, in this type of environment, oftentimes there's very little development. There's uh, could be uh, uh, to experience recreation in this area, maybe you need to have some map and compass skills. There's, Oftentimes, few signage, you know, maybe the trail tread is indiscernible from time to time. And, and uh, so that would be more uh, descriptive of trails that are developed in a wilderness environment. Spending just a couple of seconds or a few moments talking about who uses trails. So, again, who uses trails? It's uh, qualified, or I kind of define it in two different groups motorized and non motorized. And the thing to be thoughtful about, and, and this is that, is uh, when uh, considering visitor management and for good experiences, you need to plan and design for the type of use that uh, uh, is going to be occurring or that you've defined. So, real quickly, looking at some different types of visitor manage uh, types of use. So, this is a a a, a, a Jeep extravaganza, if you will, uh, uh, in uh, in Utah. And uh, uh, I mean, when you take a look at this particular image, you'll see, you know, dozens of Jeeps there. And, and you think about uh, 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 the recreation opportunities that they'll have. So there uh, uh, looks like they're, I mean, and if you simply did the math as it relates to this, you'd recognize that just even captured in this image, there's, you know, tens of hundreds of thousands of dollars in just equipment alone has been purchased to uh, facilitate these people's recreational trails experience. That doesn't include the uh, uh, the RV or the camping and uh, other gear that they purchased to get to wherever they're at. So again, uh, but yeah, certainly a, a Jeep recreation as far as a motorized type, uh, snowmobiling, another uh, common motorized form of recreation has some fairly remarkable needs. Oftentimes, you know, snowmobiles will recreate on trails and they have designated areas for snowmobile activities. Uh, motorcycling, again, is another very popular type of uh, motorized recreation. Uh, closing the kind of motorized recreation uh, uh, element of uh, uh, recreational trail use, uh, I thought I'd add this image, which is a shot of some of those uh, 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 battery operated or small motorized scooters on a trail system that's in a more urban environment. And, you know, so there's a, you know, we could probably have a a wealth of conversation about the things that we see in this particular image with uh, you know the pedestrian pedestrian use and the motor and the uh, 
scooter use and and what have you that's going on there but nonetheless so those are kind of wraps up the the uh motorized use uh describing a couple of different types of uh, uh non-motorized use certainly uh mountain biking and cycling uh it's a non-motorized type of use cyclists mountain bikers have a, a, a myriad of different interests when they're out there recreating. Some folks like to have uh, technical and, and challenging and difficult types of uh, trail features uh, to experience and practice their skill and their trade. Others like to have long distances of uh, uh, that they can actually uh, cover over uh, uh, and spend lots of time in the saddle. And then additionally, you know there may be some that enjoy the downhill recreation areas that many of the ski areas have developed so mountain biking is a, 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 a very popular and common form of non-motorized recreational trail use climbing uh well this uh young lady climbing here may not be uh, on a trail specifically she certainly used a trail to access that location and uh, uh, uh you know climbing is a very popular activity and uh, uh, Recreational trail climbers, trail climbers, uh, their their trail access needs are to get to the base of the climbing area, and uh, typically that's a fairly direct route, as you'll discover when you uh, encounter recreational trails that are uh, being used by uh, the climbing community. It's uh, oftentimes goes straight to the climbing base. Water-based trails, uh, very popular, and uh, again, you know, when you think about these types of activities, you got to think about landings and docks and a variety of other safety related measures measures uh you know cross country cross country skiing and snowshoeing and other form of winterized non uh, uh motorized type of recreation activity uh, oftentimes occurring in uh, uh, structured areas where there's uh, well-defined trails uh, and then off and as well as can be in the more wilderness environment as well the backpacking and dog walking two very popular uh, uh, recreational uh, types of activities, trail activities, equestrian use. It's another uh, real common use. Uh, and again, equestrians that oftentimes, you know, to trailer your horse to a site, you need a location where you can safely download the trailer. Uh, you know, your design uh, for a, an equestrian system typically would uh, re require, or good design has a, a large, uh, trail system they want to be able to ride for two or three hours anyhow uh, and uh, you know they'll need special unique and unique facilities oftentimes for parking their trailers where they can safely download them and, and tack up and, and spend get out on a trail so a couple of interesting things to be thoughtful about with that group and then I think the closing slide that I've got <clears throat> as it relates to uh, uh, non-motorized group is this group of uh, uh, bird watchers if you will so uh, uh, so again, uh, just another kind of activity that's pretty darn common out there on the trail system. And, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, one that, well, this group may not be uh, uh, one that is looking for a lot of solitude, but, you know, for the best bird watching opportunities, it needs to be quiet, oftentimes a more solitary type of activity. And uh, uh, <clears throat> yeah, so, but again, uh, something to be thoughtful about as it relates to design. So in thinking about this, again, I, I commented earlier about, so effective trail systems are ones that are designed to satisfy a particular type of experience. So I'm gonna spend a little bit of time, uh, we're not gonna go into a great deal of design dialogue or information, but I am gonna introduce you to some documents that I think are uh, great examples of uh, documents that trail designers should have in their library of resources uh, when considering trail design and doing that kind of work. So these two documents, one of them on the left is a document that was created a collaborative effort between the Forest Service and the uh, National Park Service and it uh, talks about uh, sustainable off-highway vehicle trails and uh, it's a great document, goodness gracious, two, 300 pages of text and information, images, design pieces, anecdotal information about how to build the trails, how to manage the trails, uh, and uh, uh, different types of 
experiences for different types of uh, uh, OHV types of applications. Similarly, the, the uh, book on the right or the design document on the right is a, again a, a large document uh, developed in conjunction with the uh, <clears throat> Novak as well as and uh, Dick DeFord created. It's a pretty current document and this too uh, provides a, a great uh, deal of references and insight into design for motorized types of use. <clears throat> Uh, it's got. It's written in a, a really good style to read. It has a lot of great tips. Uh, every chapter is crafted with a little bit of a review on the individual, the content in the preceding chapter, and uh, uh, has some great tips and techniques for trail design. So these are two great OHV books. There's others out there, I'm sure. A couple of great texts uh, associated with uh, a mountain bike community, if you will, and the mountain bike types of trails. So certainly the uh, IMBA's uh, trail solutions uh, to building sweet single track on the right there is, a, is a, 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 an outstanding uh, uh, guide for uh, trail construction design and also has some management related things. Uh, real recently, uh, I think it's in the last couple of years at any rate, maybe uh, three or four years, uh, the BLM has created a, in conjunction with the International Mountain Bike Association a great document for guidelines for quality trail experience is how this one's titled and again uh, this particular document is hundreds of pages of great illustrations and text and information about how to create trail systems that are meaningful to the mountain bike recreational trail user and I'll also add that in the uh, resource sheet that Candice will be providing you, uh, <clears throat> you will be able to find access to these documents online. Uh, some of them are for sale for a small fee, others are actually free uh, uh, to a good home. So at any rate, those are two uh, great resources for uh, non-motorized trail or non-motorized trail design documents for the mountain bike community. So this particular document, again, is one that's uh, really kind of focuses on the equestrian community. And uh, uh, it's, a, uh, again, very comprehensive and it's available in a variety of locations. You can go, you can download this from the Fish uh, Federal Highways uh, uh, and Transportation's website. And the link to that is on our uh, uh, resource sheet that will be provided. It talks about, and again, has graphics and illustrations, and a lot of great text and, and uh, uh, design guidelines. Uh, and so critical if you're going to be developing any kinds of equestrian facilities is to uh, uh, bust this book open and, and review it critically for good design ideas and concepts. A couple of uh, textbooks that I think are really productive and useful for kind of building trails uh, in a fairly uh, oh, uh, 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 traditional way are these two documents. So the Student Conservation Association uh, a few years back put together this Lightly on the Land, which is a manual for trail construction and maintenance, as well as uh, the second edition of this Appalachian Trail uh, Design and Construction and Maintenance Handbook. Two great, again, two great documents uh, that provide a, a wealth of information associated with uh, 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 hand-built types of trails, as well as some mechanical and uh, different techniques and tips providing design guidelines and criteria, uh, both for uh, uh, trail-related uh, construction and trail-related features or uh, 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 associated with the trail like shelters and signage and so forth and so on. So a couple of great documents there that you should uh, uh, consider adding to your library. National Park Services Trail Management Handbook. This is a fairly old document, and I know that they've got some other uh, documents that are available. Uh, they've uh, certainly been doing this work for a really long time and have some great information. Uh, I like one of the things I like in this particular document and, uh, when it was created is it actually has some uh, information in it fairly comprehensive, I think, about developing trail logs and, and uh, uh, trail maintenance management systems. And then I added this image. Uh, it's a, a document that I've got digitally. And 
to just kind of point out that, uh, and this is again, it's a Forest Service Trail Handbook, and if those of you that can see this, you'll see that, you know, this was revised in 1935. So what I wanna, and what's remarkable about this text is that much of the text that's in here today, much of the design work that's in here today in this book continues to be advanced uh, in as good and sustainable trail design in a variety of the documents that we just looked at. So, you know, I wanted to give a kind of a shout out to the uh, uh, U.S. Forest Service and their uh, long history of, of uh, uh, recreational trail uh, design, construction, development, maintenance, management, and we'll be spending some additional time talking about some of the other references that they've got uh, uh, out there. And, and if you're not familiar with their website on trail maintenance and management, if you Google, and I believe this will also be included in the reference sheet, if you simply Google uh, trail uh, plans and specifications, it'll take you to their website where there is a wealth of information about trails, trail development, trail design, uh, trail construction and uh, trail management. So, but yeah, 1935 and, and interestingly enough on the inside of this, they sold this document and in 1935 it sold for a walloping 15 cents. So building a little bit on the Forest Service's experience and some of the things that they suggest uh, and wanted to talk briefly about, they have established uh, some documents that are very specific associated with trail design. So uh, on that website that you can visit, and I've got an, uh, an example of one of them here in a second that we'll look at, but they've created uh, uh, in a tabular or a matrix-like format, design parameters that are uh, for these nine different types of recreational activity, right? So both motorized and non-motorized, uh, uh, both uh, uh, as well as winter and summer types of recreation. So hiker, pedestrian, uh, motorcycle, snowmobilers, all that kind of stuff. And we're going to take and kind of dive into one of these so you'll have a better understanding or appreciation of what that looks like. So, well, this is actually a copy of the, one of the pages of the uh, got design parameters for the pedestrian. And as I look at this and, and look across the top, you'll see uh, if you can see my mouse, uh, the Forest Service has identified five different classes of trails. And very briefly, uh, uh, a class one trail is uh, one that has limited or minimal forms of development. And it's a continuum, if you might add, then up to a class five where it has a remarkable or significant levels of development. So class one trail may be a wilderness-like type of trail. A class six or class five trail, rather, excuse me, would likely be more of an urban uh, type of trail system with a hardened and improved surface. But uh, those definitions are available on that website. We're not going to spend much time talking about them today because I really want to spend a, the, the time discussing about these uh, different design uses and these attributes associated with it here. So for each one of these trail classes, for a hiker and pedestrian, there are design tread widths that are recommended for different types of environments. So as I look at this and I think about a trail class three in a non-wilderness area where there's a single track or a single lane, the recommendation or the design parameters for an 18 to 36 inch wide tread. So again, looking through this, we got design tread widths. There's information associated with uh, design parameters around uh, design surfaces, you know, whether or not it's going to be graded or ungraded, smooth, whether or not it'll have a, a local material or imported material, whether or not it'll be compacted. And again, uh, so there's uh, information about the design surface and what types of protrusion and obstacles are typical or would be uh, expected, if you will, in the design surface. So this is good information for uh, design work and it helps with the construction element as well. So if you're if you're going to be building a, 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 a class three trail again, it'd be acceptable to have a, a maximum height of 10 inches of an obstacle in the trail tread surface as indicated by this guideline. Uh, to the far right with the class five, the more urban environment, there'd be an expectation where there are no obstacles. And then if you look again to the left, 
you know, in a class one in that more wilderness environment in an area where there's an actually as trail tread surface defined, it could be acceptable to have obstacles up to 24 inches in height. So the third and final attribute uh, or characteristic, if you will, or a parameter for this particular page, and then we'll go to the second page in a moment, is around design grade. And what this is about is about the relative steepness of the trail tread surface. It's about how, uh, how much increase in elevation there is as you're hiking along the trail from point A to point B. And it offers what's described in this document as a target grade. So as you look at this, and again, I'll just use the one, three, and five examples. Uh, for a class one trail in a wilderness environment, a target grade is huge in its range from five to 25%. So a very diverse level of target grade for this particular class. Moving into this class three here, the target grade for that is three to 12% for a pedestrian use, which is pretty typical in a, a rural and a, a more wilderness-like experiments, uh, experiences is a three to 12% steepness of trail. Uh, for a class five, it's two to 5%. And I'll just simply note that that 5% is typical for the Forest Service Trails Accessibility Guidelines for a barrier-free type of design. So that's the target grades or typical steepness for a particular trail. What's also good in here, and we all know if you spend any time uh, doing any trail design, but there's always things, there's always a thing that shows up that causes you to bust a grade or uh, to break that target grade for some reason. And, and they've provided guidelines here or parameters for a short pitch maximum. So again, what they're suggesting is that uh, in a class one circumstance, that you can go up to 40% grade for a short distance, right? For uh, trail class three, you can go up to a 25% grade. And then, uh, you know, certainly for class five, you know, there's a 5% is a short pitch maximum, but there are some exceptions, uh, uh, exceptions in the Forest Service's trail accessibility guidelines for up to 12% for really short distances. So, <clears throat> And then, so how much of that can you build? So let's just kind of unpack that for a second. So, and we'll look just specifically at this class three trail here in the middle of this graphic. So the target grades three to 12. I got a big rock field that I'd want to get through quickly. So I'm going to increase the trail grade to 25%, right? And how much of the total length of trail can be at that short pitch maximum of 25%? This parameter si simply indicates that uh, it would be 10 to 20% of the trail. So just in simple terms, if you've got a trail that's a, a thousand feet long or a, a trail that's 10 miles long, right? If you have a trail that's 10 miles in length, you can have up to one mile of that trail in total could be up to 25 percent or at that short pitch maximum so uh that's just kind of how that parameter works but this design grade is a great uh thing to be thoughtful about when creating experiences this, so <clears throat> thinking a little bit more about uh uh trail well i'll back up for just a second so these design parameters, as well as the trail classifications, are all available again on that website. And uh, uh, on the design parameters, uh, there the second page of this table will include information about vegetation and corridor clearing. It'll include information about the types of experience that are desired. It'll also include information about the types of facilities that are appropriate for the individual types of trail systems. So a great document with lots of good information. And again, it's, they are established for uh, both motorized and non-motorized types of use. So thinking a little bit more about visitor management and uh, uh, thinking about, you know, trying to create that satisfactory experience, you know, I, <clears throat> I wanted to comment, and this is just briefly then again about a couple of different mechanisms for doing that. So as a trail manager or a designer, you know, we 
uh, our best decisions are made when we have a full understanding of the type of audience that we're working with or the type of user or the best possible understanding of the type of recreational use that we're trying to develop for. So uh, these two different documents are outlined uh, opportunities. So the one on the left is a, a for service document that uh, describes uh, procedures for data surveys and sampling and kind of what makes sense and what works and what doesn't work. There's a lot of great anecdotal information in there uh, about uh, uh, different efforts that have uh, occurred in the past. Uh, and they talk about, I, and I, and I, very briefly, and one of the most critical things about gathering information is having a clear goal or objective. So, well, it's all fine and dandy to conduct surveys and gather data about trail visitors, numbers, satisfactions, experience, desires, so forth and so on. Having a clearly defined goal is important and uh, uh, making sure that you use the information accordingly. So, uh, so these two documents are documents that I would recommend that you explore uh, to consider developing means and methods for uh, surveying your uh, audience, surveying your trail visitor, your motorized use, your non-motorized use, uh, and you know, considering uh, it's not just about uh, the survey where we ask a series of questions. Another real important piece of information about visitor management. Uh, is relevant to volumes of use. Now, at American Trails, we recently had a, a couple of webinars on uh, trail visitor counts, and, and I'm not gonna spend much time really talking about that, but again, that's another uh, real important uh, piece of information to understand is the type of use that's occurring on your uh, recreational trails or that you wanna create trails for the type of use, as well as the uh, expectations of those users. Uh, so that you can have an aspiration or make uh, uh, provide an effort to satisfy those expectations, but also understanding the kind of ongoing volume of use and the distribution of user types. So if you're uh, having a multiple use trail, if you have a multi-use trail system, which is one where more than one different types, different types or different modes of transportations occur, you know, understanding the distribution of the levels of volumes of use amongst those different modes is oftentimes a, a useful and productive thing when making visitor management decisions as well as maintenance management decisions. So the second textbook here, uh, the one on the left with the blue cover is a forest service document. Uh, the one on the right is one that's created by the Rails to Trails Conservancy. And again, this information and a link to these locations will be in that. Uh, resource slide that Candace will send to you when it's all done. So, uh, you know, we really, it would be a disservice to you all not to briefly talk a little bit about visitor management uh, uh, as it relates to uh, trail systems and conflict, uh, and conflict management specifically. And so uh, I'm gonna kind of delve into that for a few moments. And, and I thought it would be productive for us to define uh, visitor management as goal interference, right? So, uh, you know, in today's uh, world, it seems like, you know, uh, the typical or the ideal circumstance, in part because we have limited landscapes and funding is to create multi-use types of trails uh, where we're inviting uh, different types of users with different expectations and different experiential desires to uh, show up. So, uh, you know, when you, uh, I guess to kind of put this into context, when you think about things, so in my trail experience, right, uh, you know, we had uh, in management, I had a, a both, uh, it was all non-motorized, but it was pedestrian, equestrian, and cycling, um, mountain biking typically, and uh, distribution of user type there, uh, was uh, roughly 60% uh, 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 of them were pedestrian users across the system. Uh, you know, 35% of them were from the cycling community, and then about 5% or less were from the equestrian community. And, uh, uh, you know, I had one particular trail system that uh, was very popular, and, and you know, it was, wasn't really remarkable. It wasn't huge in its linear distance, but it was huge in its popularity and, and volume of use. Uh, it saw roughly the neighborhood of uh, uh, 
Oh God, I think it was probably about 80,000 visitors a year just on a section of trail. And, uh, and if you uh, were to put all those visitors on that one section of trail, you know, you would have like six visitors, six or eight visitors on a square yard of landscape. So there's an opportunity in that group uh, uh, fairly high as it relates to some form of goal interference to occur. Another way of kind of thinking about goal interference is, well, you might have an active recreation thing like a soccer field or a football field, you know, which is, you know, if you have a soccer game on, going on out there, everybody's doing great. But if you introduce a, a, a football team and a rugby team and a field hockey team onto the same pitch, there's going to be complications. So that's goal interference, right? And what I think is important, and I think that I think uh, as managers, uh, and managing visitation, you should expect some conflict to occur and, uh, uh, and be prepared to react to it in an appropriate way. So I wanna spend just a few moments talking about uh, a couple of different mechanisms for uh, uh, minimizing and managing conflict on multi-use trails, right? So in this particular document is a, what was this is described in its title as a synthesis of uh, practices and if you uh, search on American Trails uh, website in their library of resources which I might add is amazing uh, this document will show up and it, an aspect of that are these 12 actions and I'll just kind of check in with these real quickly on this so one is you know to simply recognize that it's goal interference is a big step in moving forward with uh, uh, minimizing and managing conflicts. And then providing adequate trail opportunities is another piece of uh, this. And what that uh, could be described as is, you know, making sure you have enough, uh, 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 a broad enough range of experiences or a, a, an aspiration for, you know, different kinds of technical needs, linear distances, provide opportunities for solitude, however that might work. Uh, minimizing the number of contacts in a problem area is oftentimes trail conflict occurs as a result of some design element. Maybe there's a blind turn or maybe there's a choke point, you know, maybe you have a, 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 a spot where you're bringing a variety of different users together uh, where they're not expecting a, a bridge crossing, if you will. It could be a, a problem area or a trail junction, you know. Uh, but again, creating design that uh, minimizes uh, contacts in those problem areas is good. Uh, you know, if you have uh, uh, an opportunity to engage the stakeholders early on in the process, that's a great uh, thing it, and provides you a, a high level or opportunity for success. Much as we discussed earlier, or I highlighted earlier, the value around surveying and understanding your user needs is important. Uh, uh, and identifying the actual sources of the conflict. You know, you gotta kind of, there's, you know, there's huge emotional business around uh, these recreational trail users, right? Uh, you know, I can with good confidence say that the people that are recreating on these trails have tremendous ownership in the, not only their activity, but their experience. And so subsequently, if there's a conflict of some kind, there's likely some uh, emotional element of it as well. And, and you've got to be able to kind of as a land manager or a trail manager ferret through that and get to the to the uh, to the meat of the problem. Uh, and again, as I mentioned earlier, work with the affected users, you know, uh, develop a culture of uh, respectful and uh, uh, trail etiquette is a critical thing. There's a myriad of different uh, 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 techniques out there. You, who yields to who, uphill, downhill, left, right, turn, all that kind of stuff. But the what you need to be critical is in your recreational to community to promote trail etiquette that makes sense to the visitors that are on your system and uh, provide uh, educational uh, methods to uh, uh, teach that to other people that are new to your system. Uh, Try to encourage uh, uh, positive interaction amongst your different users. If you can create volunteer events, perhaps, where you could invite different types of users to the table to uh, participate, that's a great tool for uh, overcoming some of those silos where, you know, it's all about me and the heck with you type of thing. And also 
developing uh, a common understanding of each other's particular needs and desires. And, and I think that's good business as well and contributes to the conflict minimization. Uh, <clears throat> favor light-handed management. And you know that's a kind of a curious and interesting idea or a concept, but it, I think it has its genesis out of, uh, you know, people uh, uh, have a tendency to not like to be over-regulated, right? And uh, so if do the minimal amount of management to satisfy your needs and the experience of the visitor. Uh, <clears throat> likewise, uh, heavy regulatory management is fairly expensive. Even if it's non-personal through signage, then you have uh, uh, regulatory staff that rangers, if you will, that are charged with uh, 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 you know enforcing those regulations. And uh, so again, uh, you know, those are things to be thoughtful about. Make sure that you're acting locally and then, you know, monitoring your progress, you know, continuously kind of be engaged through uh, different tools or mechanisms for uh, visitor satisfaction and user satisfaction. You know, you can, uh, there's a, again, a myriad of different types of survey tools that are out there. You know, I've seen uh, uh, QR codes on trailhead signs where they were, agencies were uh, soliciting input took you to a survey monkey location where they asked you three simple questions you know uh, how long were you on the system how did you enjoy it so forth and so on uh, as well as insight into uh, different types of design elements there was one where there was a proposed trail development that would be occurring uh, and they were soliciting input to that as well so but again that kind of ongoing monitoring and you know I'll be just kind of offer is a bit of a, a perspective mine, and that is that, uh, you know, there'll always be some level of conflict amongst users. You could have a user segregated system where it's built completely for one system. And, you know, you know, if an individual is out for solitude and he or she encounters another individual, that's goal interference. So it doesn't matter if uh, and you should just simply expect it to occur. Uh, recognize it as part of your management responsibility for zip visitors and engage in it in a way that uh, is most productive. So conflict management, that's a great visitor management conversation. So I'm gonna spend a little bit of time talking about some different types of visitor management uh, uh, tools, if you will. So this is a park, uh, Centennial Cone Park here in the foothills west of Denver where uh, it has a uh, Monday through Friday. It's multi-use, non-motorized, hiker, horseback riders, and equestrians. Uh, uh, hikers, horseback riders, and uh, mountain bikers. And it, uh, 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 so it has a Monday through Friday uh, uh, multi-use. Anybody can come and recreate. On Saturdays or on a given odd weekend day, uh, uh, the mountain bike community has it. And on a given even weekend day, the equestrian and the pedestrian community have it. So that's kind of how this is managed. Another interesting element, so it has this alternating day use on two days of the week on a given weekend. Alternatively, uh, uh, this also has some seasonal closures for hunting and uh, uh, seasonal closure for completely for uh, elk calving area for uh, wildlife and habitat types of applications. So this is a, a process and a, a situation for those alternating day uses. <clears throat> this Mill Creek Canyon Trail System is uh, in the Salt Lake, uh, uh, east of Salt Lake City area. And uh, uh, this particular system has a couple of interesting features. So it has an odd day bikes application. Odd day allows bikes on certain trails. Other trails, they're hiker only all the time. Another interesting piece of this is <clears throat> this also has a odd day dog on leash regulation, if you will. So I don't know how many of you out there ever have management issues associated with visitor management issues associated with dogs. I'll suggest that probably many of you do. Uh, <clears throat> you know, so this is an interesting model here where you know they've established a recreational trail area that uh allows for dogs to be uh, on the trail only on a given day, on an alternating odd day of the week. This trail system uh, connects to some wilderness areas where there's some fairly restrictive recreational trail activity behaviors allowed. 
but again, so it has this alternating day use kind of application. <clears throat> you know, and as I was preparing this uh, this workshop and I, you know, I and uh, this webinar, I did a, a fair amount of research trying to identify locations where there were <clears throat> trails built that were uh, built and being managed and regulated where for specific types of use period so i was looking for equestrian only trails where no other type of recreational use other than equestrian would occur i was looking for motorcycle only trails where no other type of recreation but motorcycle use would occur or hiking or mountain biking trails well i found a, a fairly large number of hiking and pedestrian only types of trails out on the system i found very few examples of uh user specific types of or segregated trails for the other types of users. However, there has been in, over the last several, recently or in the last several years or for quite some time, there's been a lot of effort put forth to developing trail systems that are uh, with user specific experiences and goals in mind, different types of construction techniques and what have you and there being uh, 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 modeled or promoted as trail systems for that type of user. So what I've got here, and this is an example of that. So Lake James State Park uh, is a state park in, in North Carolina where there's a, 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 a fairly large trail system and they've identified an area on that property that is a mountain bike trail system. Now, pedestrian use is allowed there but the trail system designed in a fashion to uh, uh, be attracted to the mountain bike community. It also has a one-way directional trail application to it. So the mountain bike trail community travels in one direction on this trail system and it's highlighted by signs. So when you enter this property, uh, you're uh, directed to travel in a particular route or a particular direction of travel. And as such, the, the uh, pedestrian trails that show up on here, and when I talk to the people, it's fairly limited, uh, but the pedestrian visitor that shows up on here, uh, that individual is recommended to travel in the opposite direction of the mountain bike use that's occurring. So the result of that is that the <clears throat> Uh, these two different types of uses, all of their interactions are face to face, as opposed to one coming uh, up from behind on another, which is a very, I think, uh, remarkable and creative and and what I understand is a successful or effective process. It was initiated like that with the trail design and construction, so it's been like that since day one. The other kind of interesting design piece around this particular trail system in my conversation with one of the uh, staff members there was that, you know, throughout the park, they have a myriad of different, they, they close the trail systems for inclement weather conditions. And uh, what's notable about that is they actually built this trail system with that idea in mind. Consequently, it only has one access point uh, to this mountain bike trail system and a couple of other access points to the equestrian pedestrian trail systems on the other parcels. So that's fairly simple to close the system and to minimize the recreational use from occurring when the trails are wet and muddy or in a condition where recreational use causes damage. So again, some thoughtful trail design uh, as it relates to this uh, a particular site that is uh, uh, fairly new and and you know what many land managers trail managers are saddled with and I can appreciate this as well is that you know you have uh, uh, oftentimes mature or well-established visitor patterns that uh, uh, are very difficult to change uh, the social behaviors of the individuals that are on it and recreate it on it whatever type of use it is but you know i think it can be accomplished uh through thoughtful processes but certainly when you're developing new trail systems be critical of that design that you're doing 
the type of visitor that will be experiencing the trail, and what can you do to maximize their experience, minimize their impact on the landscape, and uh, good thoughts to have associated with that. So, but this is a great site. Another interesting, so, uh, so that particular previous example was one that highlighted the distinction between, uh, uh, and was trail-based, if you will, where they had spatial kind of, and temporal kinds of things for trail-based recreation. Uh, then this, on this particular one is a, a, a winter recreation area, the Vail Pass area, uh, uh, just off, uh, uh, just west of where I live, as a matter of fact. And it has a, a very popular area for both uh, motorized and non-motorized types of uh, recreation. Uh, so they went, and this, and it was, uh, I guess I'll just offer, it was, uh, for a long time, it wasn't a great recreational experience because there was limited uh, management presence established, no harm, no foul, it was just how it was. Uh, but there was uh, teams that got together and developed, uh, the Forest Service created teams of the stakeholders in the area, and they developed this uh, uh, recreation management technique there where they have areas that are common for all users, areas that are common for separate types of users. So there's areas where you can ride your snowmobile wherever you'd like, and trails where you can ride your snowmobiles on, and then there are areas where you can't do that. There are areas where you can uh, 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 cross-country ski and snowshoe on trails and uh, off trail, and then areas where you can't. So again, this kind of spatial management plan uh, for the visitor use here, I think has, has gone a long ways to uh, ideally satisfy the recreational uh, kinds of experiences for the folks that are there. So uh, kind of an interesting process. So again, uh, I wanted to, and I'm kind of wrapping up the conversation as it relates to visitor management, but <clears throat> I want to introduce you, if you're not already aware of, this Interagency on Visitor Use Management Council. So this is a, a group of individuals, and I think it was established oh, seven or eight years ago, maybe a decade ago, and it's a representative of the large federal land management agencies that provide for uh, management of our their parks and protected areas and recreation. So that would include elements of the Department of Interior and the Forest Service, or Department of Interior, the Park Service, uh, Bureau of Land Management, uh, uh, Fish and Wildlife Service, uh, uh, as well as in the Department of Agriculture where the uh, uh, Forest Service is associated with it. And, uh, and I think also the, the Corps of Engineers has an element in this. So there's a uh, half a dozen or so anyhow these agencies got together and created these these this uh, visitor use management council it was uh, again as a result of you know uh, many of the agencies had developed uh, their own techniques and ideas and thoughts and there was some duplication of services but you know there they this website again there's a link in there there's a, a visitor capacity guidebook which talks about how you can uh, manage again as it talks about manage the types of use and and, and uh, that are out there identifying capacities and and identifying resource conditions and uh, uh, different elements associated with measure, uh, measuring those and making sure those come together uh, talks about how to identify visitor capacities uh, attributes that you can evaluate and then uh, monitoring the different techniques associated. There's a collection of case studies in this manual. You can download this for free. It's a great document to help begin uh, understanding uh, capacity and, and different techniques that you might use. And then the document on your left is monitoring guidebook. Again, it's uh, uh, about uh, checking out how well you're doing, if you will, as it relates to visitor management, right? Uh, talks about how to monitor or implement a monitoring plan talks about uh, selecting indicators uh, that might be appropriate for a monitoring plan. And it uh, also provides for a, for a variety of different scenarios for a monitoring plan that might include things like the number of encounters uh, or uh, noise levels uh, and uh, you know uh, bare soils that might be examples. So again, so some different uh, tools associated with that. So these are great 
this is a great resource. There's a video on, uh, they have a couple of videos that you can look at. But again, I highly recommend that you add these to your uh, uh, library of trail uh, visitor uh, management uh, resources. So Candace, how are we doing for time? Were there, has there been any questions associated with this yet? Uh, yeah. Sorry. We definitely have um, a few questions. I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to go ahead and ask um, one of the questions right now, just because of time. So there's a question from Jesse, and it would be in regards to the alternating day use um, for the shared use trails, and wondering um, what's the best way to communicate that to the general public to control um, any confusion. So say that say that again one more time, so I'm clear, please. I'm sorry. Sure. So in regards to the alternating day use um, for shared use trails, what's the best way to communicate that to the general public to control any confusion? So there's a couple different ways of, of doing that. So there's, and it kind of depends on how, uh, how it evolves. How did you get to that point? So one way of thinking about that is if you've developed a team or a, a series of stakeholders that got you to this alternating day use process or a management plan, you know, so allowing them to communicate that to their peers would be one piece of it. Another mechanism or in addition to that, so it's a multi-pronged approach. So in addition to relying on the stakeholders uh, to communicate that amongst their peers, another piece of that is to, to uh, phase that in uh, over a window of time. So uh, and and when I mean phase that in, it's like you want to provide information, you know, maybe 30 days, maybe 45 days in advance. Hey, there's a new game in town. Here it comes. It'll be here in a week or 30 days. Hey, there's a new game in town. It'll be here in 15 days. Hey, there's a new game in town here and it starts tomorrow. Right. And then making sure and you do that through, a, you know, any number of social media processes that you have available for your regular and ongoing kinds of trail visitors. And then again, uh, there's what I would describe as the non-personal uh, uh, non personal element of it, which is signage, right? And you know that signage uh, for the alternating day use should occur front and center in a design where people are obligated to pass by it as they enter the trail system. Right, so it could be through a chicane, it could be through a gate, uh, any number of different techniques. Another thing to do too is identify places out on the trail system when you're doing this kind of build-up marketing technique for this change in activity. Is identify locations out on your trail system where people typically t stop and and uh, 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 take in a view or drink water or change up their gear. You know, you'll notice. That those are obvious out on a trail system. Use those physical locations out on your trail system to promote this change in behavior as well. So those are some alternatives, if that makes some sense. Was there another question? Um, no, I would say let's go ahead to um, the final part of your presentation. And we apologize, you will have to share your screen again. So just okay. you should see that box pop up. All right, I see it, it says show my screen. <laughs> Is it working Perfect. now? Can you see it? Yep, it looks great. All right, so great. So question and answers. So maintenance management, we're gonna talk about that. Why maintenance management? Well, of course, visitor safety is critical. You know, uh, I oftentimes think about recreational trails as having a, 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 a productive life. So we wanna extend the useful life of that. And then, you know, the other piece around maintenance management is, you know, this remarkable investment that we make in uh, recreational trails that, you know, I think those of us that are in the room have an appreciation for it, but it's it's not always given the kind of due uh, 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 attention that it needs. So, I mean, when you think about, uh, uh, when you think about the investment in a natural surface trail and, you know, uh, say you're building a path, uh, much like maybe the fellas or the folks in that in image you're building there, you know, that's a natural surface trail across a, you know, 25 or a 30% cross slope. You should expect to spend probably in a neighborhood of, you know, for budgeting purposes, twenty to forty thousand uh, uh, dollars per mile of trail construction, and just for dirt work. And then if you 
uh, apply that value across uh, you know hundreds or thousands of miles you know the investment in in trails is fairly remarkable so again maintaining that integrity of investment is important uh, so what are the uh, initial elements associated with uh, creating a maintenance management thing is to be thoughtful about creating or understanding or developing some levels of service and uh, uh, I'll offer that you know they could be created inside of both scheduled maintenance and unscheduled maintenance. So when I think about, pardon me, I had to take a drink. When I think about scheduled maintenance, these are the kinds of things that show up for me. So in a, in a hard surface trail, I think about scheduled maintenance, it'd be like mowing, uh, snow plowing, uh, non-native weed work. Maybe it's a crack or a chip seal for an asphalt trail surface. So these are things that uh, you uh, schedule on a regular basis. So maybe you mow once a month or once a week or twice a year, you know, you know that in the winter time, there'll be a certain, maybe you've elected to plow your uh, trails if you're in an environment where there's snow that occurs, right? Maybe you wanna have a, 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 a program, you have asphalt uh, trails that have uh, oftentimes develop cracks as they mature. You know, you wanna do a crack fill or a crack seal and a chip seal for your scheduled maintenance project. So those are considered a, a scheduled maintenance of a hard surface. For natural surface trails, you wanna be thoughtful about uh, erosion control structures, uh, making sure that you have good drainage established. You wanna be critical of, uh, again, vegetation management, much like in a hard surface, but it may look a little different where you're, you know, you're cutting back brush that's encroaching on a corridor and then being thoughtful about any kinds of surface grading for imported materials that you might have had or creating outslope of the trail tread surface to ensure that you have positive drainage. So those are kinds of scheduled maintenance that I think are part of a level of service that you want to establish when creating a maintenance management plan. Uh, the other thing that I wanted to talk about too as it relates to scheduled maintenance is what I refer to as capital maintenance. So when you're developing a trail system, oftentimes you're uh, 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 established infrastructure associated with it. You may be creating bridges, boardwalks, so forth and so on. And you wanna create a, 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 in your scheduled maintenance an opportunity to provide maintenance for those facilities, right? So when you think about a boardwalk construction, you know, you might experience costs depending upon the style or the design of uh, it could be as much as a, a couple of hundred bucks a square foot or a square yard uh, for boardwalk construction. And if you have, you know, several hundred feet of that or whatever the case might be, a fairly remarkable investment. And you should schedule time routinely to do whatever maintenance you need to do, be it sealing the surfaces of the, book, uh, the boards, replacing boards that are damaged and rotted or in disrepair. You should schedule time to do that on a regular basis, whatever that might be. So that capital maintenance is a big piece of it. And that oftentimes also requires fairly remarkable funding related things. So, but all these things can be scheduled. And that's why I qualify them as scheduled maintenance types of activities as a level of service. So <laughs> unscheduled maintenance. And again, I'll offer that, you know, these are things that are just gonna happen, right? Uh, you know you can count on them happening. There's just events that occur. Uh, it could be fire, it could be flood, and you know, no kidding around. Trails are, well, we think of them as kind of a, uh, uh, well, they're just simply political in nature. Oftentimes, when, <laughs> when you're, when, when there's a, uh, there could be some political element associated to some anticipated effort that needs to occur out there that will require you to uh, spend time performing maintenance. So, uh, but. Think about unscheduled maintenance as well and recognize that that's going to occur and, and don't, and we'll talk here in a moment too, but don't be so rigorous that you're not allowing for unscheduled types of things to occur. We can't plan for everything, right? Uh, and so uh, uh, again, allow and appreciate the fact that that'll occur. So <clears throat> when thinking about the distribution of time uh, associated with uh, 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 maintenance management, uh, I'll offer this as a kind of a, uh, a consideration uh, for you and your staff time. So 
if you have staff or uh, uh, you're developing a maintenance management plan, you might use this as a point of beginning, or maybe you have time accounting records that would indicate what you've typically done for scheduled maintenance. But I'll just offer that, you know, maybe as a starting point, you know, think about dedicating 40% of your time to maintenance. Maybe you have a team that that's all they do. But again, you know, I'm a, I'll suggest that most of us or many of us have teams of staff, if we have staff, that are actually dedicated to a wide variety of needs, not just maintenance. But, you know, if you've got 40% of your time scheduled to maintenance, maybe 15% for unscheduled, you know, uh, uh, you know, 10% for capital maintenance, those are pretty good values, right? Uh, I think that it's a good point of beginning, if you will, and then you apply uh, adaptive management techniques to that as you move forward. But you know, recognizing that there's also oftentimes some capital, maybe you'll be doing some trail development in some fashion. So you want to account for some time for that on an annual or a regularly scheduled basis. And maybe that could be 20% of your time and then program development, you know. Uh, so what that might be is maybe you'll want to, as an organization or an agency, you want to dedicate time. Maybe you want to create a youth core uh, to help support your efforts. Maybe you want to uh, develop a, a, a uh, an undesignated or a social trail maintenance main, a management plan. So you've got to create that in some fashion, right? So again, program development is something that you should account for in your uh, maintenance management planning or in your planning of your staff's resources and time. So this is just a suggestion. Uh, it kind of reflects some of the work that I've done historically through the years and uh, very broad terms It ebbs and flows, maybe as much as 10 or 15, maybe in a couple of years, 20% uh, different values in different areas, depending upon what was occurring. But I think this might, this kind of outline of distribution might be a good, a good point of beginning for trail managers to consider when they're distributing their uh, time for their team for maintenance management purposes. So I mentioned moments ago about a little bit about time accounting. I mean, if you've got some time accounting uh, records, those are great tools for you to use to uh, kind of evaluate what it is that you've been doing historically. Uh, you know, does it meet your needs? Are your, uh, you know, are we spending enough time doing the work that we have? But you know, time accounting is a great tool for you to document the work completed. <laughs> so I've been in a couple of situations in the past where there was uh, uh, an event that occurred that caused complications and there were uh, some FEMA uh, uh, activities associated with it. And because I was uh, 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 able to document the maintenance that I had spent on particular locations, uh, I, was, uh, uh, I had more opportunity to work with FEMA in a more effective way in securing funds for repairs. Not only that, but documenting the work that you complete is important for your risk management and uh, to helps minimize your liability uh, in a variety of different ways at least that's a uh, one perspective so documenting your work completed is uh, relevant to time accounting also supports your ability to evaluate your effectiveness right and see how well your perhaps your maintenance management planning is working and then allows you the opportunity to forecast for future work so again, time accounting is a critical piece of, I think, of maintenance management. That's about uh, understanding your uh, resources and how they're being spent. So another piece of a maintenance management planning process or maintenance management program is developing a trail inventory. Uh, one element associated with a trail inventory I'll suggest that you consider would be creating or uh, 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 collecting, if you will, administrative data. And uh, uh, physical data is another piece of that. So when I think about administrative data, these are some of the things that I like to consider as it relates to uh, uh, trail inventory, uh, administrative data. So acquisition information, and you might ask yourself, well, what is that? So, well, maybe in the acquisition, maybe it's a conservation easement and there's certain types of uh, uh, development that can occur, right? Uh, and uh, so that would be useful to have in your trail inventory if it influences the trail development and management. Uh, maybe there are uh, boundary related issues, or maybe there's a, maybe you have to dedicate a, 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 a trailhead or a, a trail name to a particular individual if there was a donation, if you will. So there's information oftentimes in the acquisition of landscape 
that will be helpful in your trail maintenance management. Identifying the type of use that it was designed for is a critical piece of it. You know, uh, if you can identify the levels of use historically, is good to have so you can monitor change over time. Uh, perhaps the year built uh, for administrative data is good information. And then also the cost to develop the trail system, whatever that might be, uh, so that you can identify how it was funded and what the typical costs were associated with it that can provide you with good information and make decisions at a later time. So, but again, part of your trail inventory should reflect some of this administrative data. Annual management costs is another piece of that. So trail inventory, physical data. So these are some things you want to, of course, you know, where's it at in the world? What's it like? Is it a site? Is it a trail corridor? Is it a park? What are the names? You know, physically you want to record or inventory or define, and perhaps this is a, 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 an ongoing thing, certainly initially what the trail length, width, and surface types are, and then modify this as changes occur uh, as a trail matures. So you want to record in information associated with any infrastructure there, signs, erosion control, bridges, turnpikes, things that anything that will require you to where there's a, any kind of investment in resources and or uh, fiscal investment, you'd likely include in a physical inventory of your trail system. Undesignated trails is another real good piece to pick up as it relates to your trail system because it helps you better understand how the recreational use is occurring out there and what's going on and, and could begin to help you in uh, uh, developing some management associated with it. So I think those are important to inventory as well. Generally speaking, you'll want to inventory the condition and, the, and this information uh, and keep that in an area that's available to the individuals that are out there. Also, recording any abandoned trails. So if you <clears throat> have a trail system that perhaps uh, has remarkable maturity or maybe you have some design trails that uh, aren't uh, meeting their expectations anymore and you're going to obliterate those. So tracking those so you can monitor change over time is important as well. So those are the trail inventory things. So I think another piece about maintenance management, this is about how you, how you identify or generate work associated with it. So condition inspections. Uh, so you want to do have an inspection process where you have uh, uh, conditions and they should be regularly scheduled. It could be monthly, it could be uh, weekly, it could be annually. You can complete them with staff and volunteers. Uh, these are a couple of inspection processes that I wanted to share with you. So this is a, uh, a process where the trail system data was collected using uh, GPS equipment and uh, ESRI software, and there was a grid overlay. So people that go out and inspect the trail could reference particular grid coordinates where there's problems or complications. So as an example, at B17, there's a washout. The sign that's at the junction of uh, in uh, quadrant uh, uh, CX, uh, there's uh, the sign is missing. So this is just another great way of communicating uh, locations and what have you on the trail system using paper methods. Uh, likewise, you could do uh, engineering station uh, for linear distance at different control points along the system for an inspection process where uh, these are actual linear distance along the trail that could provide information. You know, your inspection process, and again, this is if you're using paper to do it, would include uh, uh, some document that uh, would then need to be handled and data input. Uh, so this is an illustrative example of different types of conditions and uh, uh, what have you that you would be looking for in a trail condition inspection. Alternatively, and this is a, an image of a uh, an app that has been developed uh, uh, on a trail system here in the, uh, Colorado on a, in a wilderness area. And uh, it reflects, uh, uh, Esri, uh, it uses the Esri software and it uh, has a trail system on there. And <clears throat> there's a whole series of uh, tables and information and drop downs that you can identify conditions and, and uh, locations and add descriptions and add images. So this then is all fed into a database electronically and you can do this while you're on site with an app that's available on your phone. So 
when thinking about trail condition assessments, you want to be thinking about developing some guidelines. So this is a collection of standards, if you will, for the trail systems at the Forest Service. And there's, you know, uh, it looks like there's uh, a half a dozen different key measures here, health and safe, health and cleanliness, you know, key measures associated with resource setting, safety, responsiveness, and then again, of course, the condition of facilities. We'll talk a little bit more about this in a second. Another mechanism for kind of qualifying and, uh, and generally creating conditions is to, you know, uh, uh, jot this down. It's a, uh, certainly removes some of the uh, subjectivity around it. So you have trails that are in good condition and functioning as designed, which is a, a great thing to have. And you have trails that are in fair conditions where they're uh, and they're okay, but they're really not working well. And there's a little bit of a, a, a descriptive there. So maybe uh, uh, in order uh, for trails that are in fair conditions, maybe it's expected that even though maintenance is temporarily effective, we expect continued degradation. And maybe to repair this, it will require some funding. Maybe there's a reroute or a realignment or importing material. And likely a plan of some quality will need to occur. Then the third type of condition that you might consider developing or something like this would be where there's poor conditions, where things are failing. And this is typically as a result of some kind of event, if you will, or uh, you, the consensus is that, or the perspective is that routine maintenance is not effective in stabilizing the trail conditions. So these are other kind of condition uh, uh, assessments that you might use to help you make decisions about where you're going to be spending your time on your trail and what you're going to be dealing with. So the work needs to get put into a trail log so you can create databases where there's drop down menus and they're searchable. You can use spreadsheets that uh, create this information. This particular one here has, you know, the year it was identified, when you wanted to put it in, who owns it. Maybe, uh, maybe this uh, annual work planning document has a variety of things, not just maintenance, but also capital improvement projects, any trails that are in the planning stage, design, construction stage. So you can sort this information. It has names, descriptions, linear distances, anticipated hours, and so forth and so on. So you take the information from your trail log or your trail spreadsheet, all your projects, and you create an annual work planning document. Uh, this is one uh, way of kind of managing your staff. Again, another spreadsheet or tabular format where you know this particular document that I've used in the past is one where you know, all these different types of uh, 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 staffing levels are established with a table where you can input values to determine the number of hours that they'll be contributing to the organization, as well as volunteer events and exercises. And then you input that information into a calendar, right? So on this calendar, you might have a list of projects and then the month and type of the uh, number of hours that you'll be dedicating to that particular project. And it helps you kind of manage those in a way so it helps balance the hours that you've got with the projects and the projected hours that it'll take and when you're going to do that over the course of a calendar year and how that comes together so this is that annual work planning scheduling piece that you might consider developing something like this so as it relates to the workforce development staff you got paid staff certainly full-time youth corps, contracted services, volunteer program development, uh, you know, consider these elements associated with it, having regular events, skills workshops, crew leaders, different types of volunteer stuff. This example here is of a, a Chatfield State, a, a, of a park where they have management zones, and then in the individual management zones, so I look back, so it has a development zone, kind of a passive recreation and a natural zone, and then there was a, a development of uh, maintenance management guidelines for each one of those zones. So they created different management prescriptions based upon the type of management zone that they were in. So a couple of closing comments on this maintenance management. We've got this, these two documents. And again, these are available in the resource page. Forest Service has created this trails assessment and condition survey process. This is an amazing document that has lots of information that you can take bits and pieces from or embrace completely, as well as their trail fundamental and trail management objectives documents really kind of puts structure to uh, uh, options and uh, mechanisms for uh, managing trail systems. Whew. How are you doing, Candace? <laughs> okay, well, 
We are close to end time, but we'll I go ahead and definitely close. ask a few questions. No, you have great information, so don't you worry. Um, so I, we do have uh, quite a few questions at this point. I'll ask um, a few of them right now during the live webinar. But again, a reminder, I will work with Kim following the webinar to answer all of the questions in writing. And I will share the document with all attendees, as well as post it on this webinar's web page um, following uh, or you know, as soon as that's, av that's available. So um, a question then for you here, Kim, um, and Taylor is actually helping control my closing slides right now because <laughs> I'm having some internet issues. Um, one question from Kip is just wondering if you can tell us more about the app that you had mentioned um, in regards to trail assessments. Absolutely. So and I can include some contact information associated with that. So. That app was generated by, a, a, I believe, and I may be speaking a little out of school, but what I understand, it was created by a, a Forest Service employee that works here uh, in the uh, Clear Creek Ranger District. Uh, he's a wilderness ranger for those uh, the, for the Friends of Mount Evans and Lost Creek Wilderness. So he, uh, his background is in cartography, and he created that using the uh, Esri software. I don't know the details around it, but what I do know is that uh, he has the ability to allow those that those two groups, as well as other individuals, to downsource the app, and he can do crowdsourcing of information about trail conditions associated with it. So again, it's a, a I'm not sure how available it is for you know copying, using, or what have you, but and there's a variety of those that are out there. This is just one example. Um, Lawrence is um, asking, how do how do you encourage riders to slow down in congested areas? So a great question. You know, it's kind of like when you're traveling in a school zone. How do you keep people from going over 20 miles an hour or 15? It's it's difficult, absolutely difficult, and it's a, a personal choice as far as speed goes. But there are certainly design characteristics and considerations that you can do to uh, help scrub speed. There's a uh, 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 a design characteristic, it's called a chicane, which is a series of turns. Maybe there's physical structures that results in that, uh, that can uh, encourage uh, uh, speed scrubbing and reduction, you know, uh, 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 and there's some, uh, some debate around the value added of limiting site distances uh, for uh, 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 speed reduction. You know, you want to be thoughtful about how those kinds of things come together at uh, uh, trail junctions or entering areas where there's high levels of congestion. So again, if you uh, uh, <clears throat> could put it chicanes in where uh, uh, individuals traveling at a higher rate of speed are required to go through a series of left or right turns, uh, those are techniques that are, have been available or are successful. But a big part of it is just marketing, right? You got to watch your speed. That's probably one of the greatest contributors to conflict out there is, uh, uh, is uh, a disparity among speed and recreational use. All right, thank you. Um, Julie is um, asking um, if you could address social trails um, in regards to visitor management. Well, we, we only have a few moments, <laughs> <laughs> but I can certainly know, I'll, I'll offer that a couple different things. So in a more urban environment, uh, social trails or undesignated trails are often, uh, uh, as a re they're kind of temporal. So you may have a, 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 a property or a recreation or use that's occurring that, you know, I'll just say that as a, as a, as a neighborhood uh, uh ebbs and flows with its uh, 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 population, the, the social trails will change as well. <clears throat> so there may be uh, young kids in the neighborhood for a while that are coming from this area and going to that area with little dis or with disregard for using the trail. So that would be one piece of it. So again, they can kind of ebb and flow <clears throat> based upon the type of use that's occurring and, they're, uh, uh, and how well-defined they are. Uh, I think that they're problematic for a variety of different reasons. One is that People don't recognize or oftentimes aren't able to distinguish between managed trails and unmanaged trails can cause complications as it relates to uh, <clears throat> visitor management, people getting lost, injured, and uh, 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 risk management related things. Also, social trails, I believe, uh, uh, contribute to the fragmentation of the landscape and uh, increasing levels of habitat uh, uh, 
conflict and uh, diminished habitat quality. All right, thank you. Um, we'll go ahead and ask one more question. Um, uh, Chantel is asking for trails that permit motorized and non-motorized use. How do you manage the trail condition expectations? That's a great question. Uh, so, and, and I think I think part of it is is just uh, having an appreciation. So, so, and I'm not really clear. It's a little bit. I'm not clear in the question itself. So, my I'll take a couple of different tacks at it. So, my assumption is is that the the perspective is that a trail that has motorized use will have different kinds of conditions than a trail that doesn't have motorized use i'll take that tact and uh uh you know i think a uh, uh, part of it has to do with uh the the social element around people that are going out there need to know that it's uh, a trail that has these types of recreational activities are occurring on them and that they'll be remarkably different than other areas where there are different kinds. So again, part of that's going to be in some marketing types of things. Part of it's going to be in communication. The other piece of it's going to be around uh, uh, just acknowledging that that's, that's the reality of it, that different visitors uh, oftentimes bring to the table uh, uh, varied impacts to the physical quality of the trail tread condition and communicating that to the world out there. There's a big lift that needs to go on as it relates to education. All right, great. Well, appreciate your time and answering the few questions that we could during the live webinar, Tim. Again, I will work with you following the webinar to answer Absolutely. any of the um, remaining questions. And of course, if any attendees have any questions for these next couple minutes, you can definitely um, send them our way. You can also email us at Trailhead or you can also email Kim directly as well. Um, so um, thank you guys so much. I want to again thank the partners of this webinar, um, along with Kim and Chinook Associates. I want to thank the Bureau of Land Management, the Federal Highway Administration, the National Park Service, as well as the U.S. Forest Service. And if you are enjoying these webinars, um, we, uh, we hope that you will consider donating as little as $5 by texting I'm for Trails to 44321 and your donation will go to the Trail Fund, which is a program of American trails that helps enable us to build a fund that's dedicated to maintaining and enhancing America's trails through maintenance, research, and stewardship training projects. And as I've mentioned before, that we are really hoping to launch this program um, and have applications available for your trail projects um, towards the end of the year, if not in early 2022. And uh, for those that do donate immediately following this webinar, I will select a couple people um, to receive one of our Trail Boss mugs as a thank you. And finally, um, I want to invite you to join us for all of our webinars in September, and um, you will help us celebrate our 10-year anniversary of the Advancing Trails webinar series. We are very excited for this. Um, we have received more than $13,000 in giveaways so far, totaling over 80, um, 80 sorry, giveaways from more than 40 donors. So there will be at least one winner um, per day starting September 1st, all throughout the month of September. You can view a list of the giveaways and donors online, and you are still welcome to donate um, to showcase your business or a business or nonprofit to the trails community. And we also have a free exclusive advertising opportunity available for all donors um, at whatever level you are able to donate something. Just contact me for more details on that. And again, thank you to everyone for attending. I hope you enjoy the rest of your day and happy trails.